When I was 10 years old, my best friend was a Methodist. <clears throat> he and I determined that we would know which of our churches was true based on whether Southern Methodist University or BYU won the Holiday Bowl game to be played on December 19, 1980. <laughs> it did not look good for the restoration when BYU trailed by, by 20 points with four minutes left. And then the Cougars recovered an onside kick and scored, and then they blocked a punt and scored. And then with no time left on the clock, quarterback Jim McMahon threw a Hail Mary that Clay Brown caught amid a thicket of defenders in the end zone. It was a miracle. <laughs> now I knew which church was true. <laughs> it was that simple. In football, as you may know, a Hail Mary is a hope-filled prayer that the trailing team offers in the form of a desperate pass into the end zone with no time remaining. I did not know while I was watching the game that a Hail Mary is also a Catholic prayer. That fact interrupted my ignorance sometime after the game when I learned about Clay Brown's post-game comment. It was a Hail Mary, he said. That's all right. Jim and I are both Catholics. Wait, what? Two Catholics connected to bring to pass the miracle? My childish conclusion was less simple than I had thought. Everything became simple and certain again early the following spring, however, when the BYU men's basketball team trailed Notre Dame 49-50, facing elimination in the NCAA tournament with just a few seconds left. That's when Danny Ainge took the inbounds pass, dribbled the length of the floor, going between, around, and finally over future NBA players and scoring the winning basket with two seconds left. That's a true story. Actually, it's more complex than that. It's a historical narrative. There's nothing false in the story, but it is overstated and overly simple. The sports facts are objectively true, by which I mean that they're verifiable regardless of one's perspective, whether you cheer for the Cougars or the Mustangs or the Fighting Irish. So one ingredient of a historical narrative is some selected objective facts. Another ingredient in my narrative is subjective facts, by which I, means, I mean the ones that you can't verify, like the, convert, uh, like the conversation, rather, with my Methodist friend. I could take you right to the spot where that occurred, but did it happen just the way I remember? I don't know, and neither do you. Another ingredient in my story was interpretation. By interpretation, I mean the way I endowed facts with meaning beyond what you or I can prove or disprove. I took all those components and arranged them to serve my present purpose of priming you to think like a seeker. Narratives abound in the information age. We're surrounded by, infused with, even in one sense composed of stories like mine. Some narratives are simple, some are sacred, even salvific. Some of them are sinister. Some are seductive. We must choose which narratives to make ours. How can we know what is true and trustworthy? The best way I know is to be a seeker precisely as the Lord prescribed in Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 118, where he said, And as all have not faith, seek ye diligently, and teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books, words of wisdom. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. One way to read the first line of that verse is, since none of us have too much faith, we should be seekers. The why of seeking is to grow our faith. The what of seeking is wisdom and learning. The how is diligently, by study and also by faith. And the where of seeking is out of the best books. Becoming a seeker is hard intellectual and spiritual work. It's a long, slow, deliberate process. A seeker might Google as part of the process, but Googling and seeking are not synonyms. And just praying about something is not seeking either. Oliver Cowdery tried that. The Lord told him, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost. When Oliver didn't hear anything in either place, the Lord explained why. 
You took no thought, save it was to ask me, the Lord said, and then taught, you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me. Oliver assumed that all he had to do was ask God. I assumed that I could know the truth by the outcome of a football game. Seekers learn to identify and interrogate their assumptions. What are you assuming about the restored gospel? What are you knowing, really knowing? And how do you know it? These are epistemological questions. Epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge. What is knowledge? How can we know? I often ask my students what they know and how they know because it helps them be metacognitive. It helps them be aware of their own thought processes. When I asked you what you know and how you know, I invited you to be metacognitive about your epistemology because you will rely on that skill as a seeker. So how does one become a seeker? I'll get to that question a little later by telling another story. First, I'll explain some concepts that inform what I'm saying. In their important little book, Faith is Not Blind, Marie and Bruce Hafen describe how faith can develop according to our Heavenly Parents' plan of happiness. We begin in simplicity, which includes faith in simple truths like, I am a child of God and He has sent me here. But simplicity also includes faith in assumed ideals like, has given me an earthly home with parents kind and dear. Simplicity is a perfectly fine place to begin exercising faith. We're just not supposed to stay there. The plan is for us to grow up. So we are meant to develop deep, mature, abiding faith in things as they really are and of things as they really will be. We are supposed to learn that truth is knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. As we grow up, we learn that things are more complex than we may have been taught and assumed. That is true about every subject, math and language, art and science. It's true about the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. The restoration isn't simple. And when all goes to plan, we confront its complexity as part of growing up. You're not awed or out of place if you're encountering complexity as you progress in the plan of happiness. Complexity introduces us to more facts that compel us to revisit our simple conclusions. Complexity shows us that the real and the ideal are often not the same. Some of you know very well, for example, the cold, hard fact that not all parents are kind and dear. When we wrestle with facts like that, it's common to question whether we are children of a God who has sent us here. When we confront complexity, it's common to feel dissonance or tension between the ideals we thought we knew and the reality we now see. We become aware that there is more than one narrative, more than one point of view, and then we think about what we know and how we know it. We consider and experiment with options and alternatives. We choose what we will believe and how we will interpret the facts and what narrative we will use to make sense of the facts. We choose whether our faith will grow up, continue to be childish, or die. Seekers make that choice metacognitively by diligently learning from the best sources. They read the best sources, not other people's opinions about the best sources. They come to terms with what they know and how they know it. They may rely on others, parents or professors in the beginning, but ultimately seekers don't let anyone else choose for them what they know and how they know it. By sources, I mean sources of knowledge, like Joseph Smith's manuscript history, which is excerpted for us in the Pearl of Great Price. Sources like this one are precious. Without them, we could not know the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Seekers learn to be source critics. That doesn't mean insulting a source's wardrobe choices. Source criticism is careful thinking about sources of knowledge. It's hard work, but you are all capable of it. And there are many professors on campus across the disciplines who want to help you think critically about sources of knowledge by study and by faith. Both study and faith are vital. Seekers recognize that rationality and spiritual experience can both be reliable paths to knowledge and that they can both be fickle and subjective. 
So seekers combine both rationality and spiritual experience to complement and correct each other, to check and balance. Seekers don't privilege the head over the heart or vice versa. They heed the Lord's command to study while they exercise faith. They trust that the Lord will reveal to their mind and to their heart, as He promised. All that hard work leads seekers through complexity to what the Hafens call simplicity on the other side of complexity. They borrowed the terms from a judge who said, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. The simplicity after complexity comes from knowing the facts and the alternative ways of interpreting them. It comes from intentionally choosing narratives that interpret the facts with faith and hope and charity, instead of interpretations that are unbelieving, cynical, or unkind. Simplicity is naive faith. Other side simplicity is informed faith. It is more mature than complexity. Other side simplicity knows everything complexity knows and more. For our faith to grow and develop according to God's plan, we must come to terms with complexity but not get stuck there. The plan is for us to seek our way from simplicity through complexity by study and by faith until we arrive at the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Someone might object that seeking, as I'm advocating it, just leads to confirmation bias. If you're seeking to know the truth of the restored gospel, they might say, you will find or focus on what you want. I grant that people have bias, all people. Believers and unbelievers, pro and con, those who are for the restored gospel and those who are against it. Becoming a seeker didn't eliminate my biases. Seeking simply helps me be more metacognitive about my biases. Unbelief doesn't end bias either. Being biased is a human condition. Bias thrives when we ignore evidence. So what I'm advocating is that we be aware of our biases and educate them. Let's learn all the facts and evaluate various interpretations. Then we'll have more of what Doctrine and Covenants section 88 calls wisdom, with which to intentionally choose the narratives that are the most true and trustworthy. Bias is real, but so is the simplicity on the other side of complexity. We can seek our way to it with both disciplined brain work and relentless spiritual work. That's what I know, and this is how I know it. On my mission, I decided to become the world's greatest scripture expert. I assumed that would be a little hard, but not too hard. When I returned to BYU after my mission, I enrolled in Biblical Hebrew and Old Testament and I discovered that the Old Testament is really, really complex. I had assumed that Moses wrote the so-called books of Moses, and then I actually read them and realized that if he did, he did it in a weird way, which raised some questions. One question was epistemological. How did Moses know what happened in the beginning with Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham? The Bible doesn't answer that question. The book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price answers it, it says that God revealed the beginning to Moses. The Book of Moses tells how Moses knew. It doesn't tell who the author is or how they know what Moses knew. Neither the Bible or the Book of Moses answer the authorship question. Both the Pentateuch and the Book of Moses are written in an omniscient third-person perspective that does not disclose whose it is or how it knows what it knows. That includes the story of Moses' death and burial in Deuteronomy chapter 34. But then Alma chapter 45 says, The Lord took Moses unto himself, and Mormon cites the scriptures as his source of that knowledge. So Mormon scriptures told a different story than our Bible does. That should be enough Old Testament talk to illustrate my trip from simplicity to complexity. The more I studied the Old Testament, the less I knew. Or rather, the more metacognitive I became about how little I knew and about how complicated knowing actually was. About that time, I took Religion 341, the elective church history class titled Joseph Smith and the Restoration, and I decided that I had to know everything my professor knew and how she knew it. I caught up to her in the hallway of the Iring Science Center after class one day and asked how I could do what she did. She smiled and said, get a PhD. So I did. 
Along the way, I learned that the Restoration is richly documented. There are lots of best books, meaning primary sources of knowledge. You can find many of them at josephsmithpapers.org. They include Joseph Smith's autobiographies, journals, letters, translation manuscripts, and revelation manuscripts. It was thrilling to me to realize that I could study the handwritten source material of a real, live revelator. I learned to read the sources. Literally, I learned to read the handwriting, but also to be source critical so I could assess what they could tell me and what they couldn't. I've been reading those best books ever since. Along the way, I picked up a useful seeking tool in a philosophy class, the discipline of slowing down enough to pick a proposition apart, determining what it means, and deciding when, or rather, whether it can be justified. Consider, for example, the proposition that I just made. Joseph Smith was a revelator. What does it mean? Can it be justified? If, in the time since you heard me finish the questions, you've already concluded that you know what it means and is justified, then you're not yet grasping what I mean by being a seeker. If you're slowing down and wondering what it means that Joseph Smith was a revelator and wanting to painstakingly internalize all the available evidence that could either justify or discredit that proposition, and you are determined to carry out that process by study and by faith for as long as it takes, then you are grasping what it means to be a seeker. There is a lot at stake in deciding how you will define revelator. How would you arrive at that definition? Would you default to a definition based on one or more unsound assumptions? Would you decide, for instance, that a revelator is a perfect person or nearly so? Would you decide that a revelator is someone who produces revelations in perfect English? Would you decide that there are no such things as revelators these days? Would you base your definition on objective facts? Which ones? So very much depends on the definition you choose. So I beg you to base your definition on evidence, lots of it. Good, solid, source-based evidence, including all of the knowable facts. That's what seekers do. But some people unthinkingly base their definitions on hypotheticals, on ifs that are nothing but assumptions. I call that hypothetical history, but it isn't historical at all. It isn't scientific. It's not based on any kind of sound thinking. Let me give you three examples. If the first vision is true, there would be a single account of it. If Joseph Smith experienced the first vision, he would have written it at the time. If Joseph's revelations were true, there would never be any changes made to them. Well, those might seem like unassailable truths, but they are not. They're just unexamined assumptions posing as foregone conclusions. The seekers are not content with that kind of thinking. As a BYU student, I had an experience that catalyzed my life as a seeker. I got to work with esteemed professors, one a Methodist named Jan Ships and the other a Latter-day Saint named John Welch. They were co-publishing the journals that an early Latter-day Saint convert named William McClellan wrote between 1831 and 1836. I was assigned to help Professor Ships compare the original journals to typed copies to ensure accuracy. I read William's journal entries closely as I learned the historical method and document editing. Those academic disciplines were entwined with evidence that Joseph Smith was a revelator. In the summer of 1831, William gained an enduring testimony of the Book of Mormon by what he called examinations, searches, and researches, and earnest prayer to God to direct me into truth. He wrote later about how he prayed for a revelation from the Lord through Joseph. I went before the Lord in secret, he said, and on my knees asked him to reveal the answer to five questions through his prophet, and that too without Joseph's having any knowledge of my having made such request. I now testify in the fear of God that every question I lodged in the ears of the Lord was answered to my full and entire satisfaction. 
I desired it for a testimony of Joseph's inspiration, and I, to this day, consider it to me an evidence which I cannot refute. William was the scribe for that revelation, Doctrine and Covenants, section 66. He copied it carefully into his journal after these words, The Lord condescended to hear my prayer and give me a revelation of his will through his prophet or seer, Joseph, and these are the words which I wrote from his mouth. William bore a kind of testimony at the end of the revelation when he heavily underlined the words, Joseph Smith, Revelator. In a letter to his relatives, William testified that Joseph Smith was a prophet, a seer, and revelator to the Church of Christ. Working with sources of knowledge like Joseph's Revelation manuscripts and William McClellan's journals and letters showed me that brain work could strengthen my faith. It also exposed some of my assumptions. It taught me to think more carefully and critically. My definition of a revelator became more complex and more justifiable. Working with sources of knowledge helped me to expect and to cope with ambiguity and paradox in people, including prophets like Joseph Smith and apostles like William McClellan. That is one chapter in a long story of how I became a seeker and how studying the best books with rigorous faith led to my knowledge that Joseph Smith is a revelator. It is a true story. Professor Richard Bushman, Joseph Smith's best informed biographer, said, the closer you get to Joseph Smith and the sources, the stronger he will appear, rather than the reverse, as is so often assumed by critics. He's right about that. I know. When I was in your shoes, I started to study those sources diligently, and that work has intensified and continued ever since. And that's how I know that Joseph Smith was a great revelator. I'm not asking you to accept what I say on the authority of my seeking. I'm inviting you to do your own. I have justified confidence in your abilities to seek diligently by studying the best books while exercising faith, and I have good reason to believe that the Lord will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And I deeply desire to see each of you on the other side. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.